All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, Jim Humphreys. I teach at Murray State University. I teach in the history department and I am in my 12th year. I'm a uh, was born in North Carolina and spent a lot of a lot of my life there, but now I'm a Kentuckian and um, I live here in Murray and teach at uh, Murray State. My main fields are Southern history, um, Old South and uh, New South, and Civil War, a lot of 18th and 19th century. But I also teach world history here at uh, Murray State, uh, like a lot of professors do. And I'm very glad to be here tonight. And I'd like to thank uh, Bobby Wrinkle and everyone there at the. McCracken County Public Library. This is the third talk that I've given, and I've really enjoyed the, the other two, and I'm sure we'll enjoy this one tonight. Um, the first one was on Lincoln, race, and emancipation, and then I also gave a talk on Andrew Jackson and, uh, and Indian removal. Tonight's topic is a sad and somber but a timely topic, the devastating 1918 flu pandemic. In his 1929 novel, Look Homeward Angel, the North Carolina author Thomas Wolfe described the death of his brother Ben from, uh, from the flu that was really racking the world at the time. He wrote, then under the terrible light which fell directly and brutally upon the bed alone, he saw Ben. And in that moment of searing recognition, he saw what they had all seen, that Ben was dying. Ben's long thin body lay three quarters covered by the bedding. Its gaunt outline was bitterly twisted below the covers in an attitude of struggle and torture. It seemed not to belong to him. It was somehow distorted and detached as if it belonged to a beheaded criminal. And the sallow yellow of his face had turned gray. Out of this granite tent of death lit by two red flags of fever, the stiff black furs of a three day beard was growing. The beard was somehow horrible. It recalled the corrupt vitality of hair which can grow from a rotting corpse, and Ben's thin lips were lifted in a constant grimace of torture and strangulation above his white, somehow dead-looking teeth, as inch by inch he gasped a thread of air into his lungs. And the sound of this gasping, loud, hoarse, hoarse rapid, unbelievable, filling the room and orchestrating every moment in it, gave to the scene its final note of horror. Ben lay upon the bed below them, drenched in light like some enormous insect on a naturalist table, fighting while they looked at him to save with his poor wasted body the life that no one could save for him. It was monstrous, brutal. Wolf also wrote a, a poem about Ben called O oh, oh, Lost, and this is part of it. What things will come again? Old spring, the cruelest and fairest of the seasons will come again and the strange and buried men will come again. In flower and leaf, the strange and buried men will come again, and death and the dust will never come again, for death and the dust will die. And Ben will come again. He will not die again. In flower and leaf and wind and music far, he will come back again. O oh, lost and by the wind grieved ghost, come back again. So between 1918 and 1920, and really even into the 1920s, as many, possi possibly as many as 100 million people died a death that was similar to what Wolf, uh, Wolf described. Um, and uh, many other writers um, actually did not write much about the pandemic. Some have called it, like Alfred Crosby, the forgotten pandemic. Uh, there was Catherine Ann Porter who wrote Pale Horse, Pale Rider. There was William Maxwell, They Came Like Swallows. But other writers, Hemingway, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, did not write much about, the, much about this devastating um, flu pandemic in their writings. John Dos Passos, American uh, novelist, actually contracted the disease on a ship on his way to Europe, which was really uh, horrible. But yet he didn't, he, did, he didn't mention it virtually at all in his uh, writing. This pandemic was one of probably the worst health crisis of the 20th century, but yet it has receded in our uh, memory, although it's getting a lot more attention today, um, it, isn't it, because of the COVID-19. Uh, COVID what is a pandemic? Uh, a pandemic is a disease, of course, that uh, spreads among countries. Um, and is um, uh, extremely deadly. The 1918 flu uh, pandemic spread to virtually every corner of the globe 
and it spread very quickly in just a few months. It spread um, from large cities to small towns to um, uh, remote um, places. Um, uh, and it was extremely devastating. Um, and of course, influenza pandemics have occurred uh, before. The term influenza was coined in Italy in the 1400s because many thinkers thought that the virus was affected by the motion or the quote, influence of the stars. And so it's been around a long time. The, the, again, the term was coined in for the 1400s, but it's been around a, lo a long time. And uh, influenza plagues and other types of diseases have played major roles in history. You can go back to ancient times, 5,000 years ago when cities began to be developed, uh, pandemics became a more serious problem that sometimes killed thousands or millions. And one reason this is, is because the flu, uh, the flu is really a crowd disease. When people stopped being hunters and gatherers and they settled, settled down about 10 or 12,000 years ago, um, uh, then pandemics became a bigger problem because these pandemic microbes, uh, they need um, a host, animals or humans. Um, and um, when cities began to be developed, we began to see more, more and more plagues. And then of course, there was the bubonic plague in the 14th century that killed possibly 20 million people between India and Iceland um, in the mid, the mid 1300s. And of course, you know, this was extremely devastating, but the 1918 flu back, uh, pandemic um, is, is going to be uh, even worse. And then we have, for example, the um, ex uh, explorers from Portugal, Spain, England, the Netherlands and other places coming to what they call the new world and they brought, uh, they brought devastating diseases that virtually wiped out the Indian populations in some, in some uh, places. When a disease or virus is introduced for the first time in an area, we call this a virgin soil disease. And these virgin soil diseases were devastating for the, um, Amer for the Native Americans um, because they had no antibodies in, in their uh, bodies. So influenza has been around for a long time. It is caused by a virus that finds its natural home in wild ducks, and it only, infect, only infects human, humans when it crosses the species barrier, sometimes passing from birds to people and sometimes moving through an intermediary species, such as pigs or horses. And when an animal disease like this becomes a human disease, it has the potential to become a pandemic because humans have no antibodies in their body. To, they have no prior immunities often to fight these diseases that, slow, that slowly shift from animals to um, humans. And one of the main ways humans can pick up these animal diseases, and we have a lot of uh, you know, viruses and microbes around and in our bodies, and our bodies take care of most of them. But these viruses can change they can uh, not really leap, but slowly ooze from animals to uh, um, humans and cause great devastation. And one of the main ways humans can pick this up is through, you know, from animals, you know, is through um, uh, killing and dressing um, animals, you know, um, actually eating them is not that, that big a problem. But those who kill them and then dress the animals and things like that, um, all, often, uh, you know, can serve as a host for these diseases that jump from animals to um, humans. There have been many plagues and pandemics in world history, but as far as the uh, flu pandemic, there have been five prior episodes in the last 125 years. 1889-1890, um, a flu pandemic killed a million people in Russia. In 19, and then there, and then of course there was the great 1918 pandemic, which was the worst, by far the most severe in those 120, 125 year period. And researchers can still not say exactly why it was so devastating. There was another one in 1957, another in 1968, and of course one in um, 2009, and our focus is 1918. This virus was both extremely deadly and easily transmissible. Symptoms would begin to appear after a couple days. 
you know, the COVID virus, it takes at least five or six days and maybe two weeks for symptoms to appear. But with the flu pandemic, it took only a day or maybe th uh, maybe up to three days for symptoms um, to appear. So if somebody was close to somebody like a family member or friend and they heard them cough, well, back then, well, they probably knew that they had it also. Sometimes people would just, people who seem to have no symptoms would just collapse. Um, and you knew if that was like a family member or friend that you were close to that you probably had it also. And if it, um, it, it tended to kill members of society who normally survived the flu with few complications. Those who are young, otherwise healthy adults between the ages of 18 and 45. Two thirds of the deaths caused by this influenza, 1918 and 1920, were uh, 18 to 45 year olds. The peak age death was 28. Um, and so why? Why did it attack um, the youngest, which sounds kind of count counterintuitive, um, but some uh, researchers believe that the virus turned the immune system against one's body. And when the immune system strongly reacts against one's body, it's called a cytokine storm. And this is what we're worried about with COVID-19. People with the strong immune uh, systems would have trouble. It was also believed that the older population seemed to have some immunity built up from a past H1N1 virus. As I said, a lot of the people who were dying were younger people, 18 to uh, 245. What were the origins of the 1918 influenza pandemic? Um, scholars, uh, until recently, held to the theory that the origins were in the state of Kansas. A Kansas doctor named Loring Minor reported a mysterious outbreak of a disease to the United States Public Health Service in late March of 1918. And this is when the pandemic began spreading around the world. It was in March, of early March, 1918. Loring noticed that in Haskell County, Kansas, there was this mysterious disease in which 18 people had fallen ill. Three of them had died. And so he was so alarmed that he contacted health authorities. And the theory goes that this flu virus spread very quickly to soldiers at Camp Funston near Junction City, Kansas. And one of the first people to get it was a cook. And we even know his name. I, I don't have his name, but they actually know his name. He's walking along in the camp and he collapses one day and people surround him and try to help him. And soon at Camp Funston in Kansas, at the beginning of March, um, many soldiers are, many soldiers are, um, are infected. And of course, these soldiers are going to be moved to other camps. They're going to be, they're going to go to Europe. They're going to go to other places. There is no doubt that the first, the, the first World War played a major role in spreading this virus quickly. Just imagine if we were fighting a world war now. It would just be absolutely devastating, wouldn't it? Troops traveling across the ocean, living in trenches, refugees moving from place to place, prisoners of war sometimes were moved around. Uh, uh, Europe, the backdrop of World War I. Uh, definitely played a role in promoting this flu pan pandemic. And we'll look at that a little bit more in just a moment. But back to the origins. Today, scholars are probably more likely to agree that the, or at least say the best theory for the origins was in China, in China. John Barry, who wrote a very good book about this, argued for the Kansas thesis. But more recently, he argues for the China thesis. In November of 1917, the strange, a strange and deadly disease of unknown origin began to spread in northern China. It then diffused around the world to North America, to Europe, and we believe that it was the Chinese labor corps on its way to the Western Front that possibly spread a disease that's, that started in um, China. And it crisscrosses across the globe in just a matter of months. Many of those people who were infected ended up on the battlefields of um, Europe. And as I said, there was hardly a corner of the world that was not affected badly by this dev devastating flu pandemic. So some scholars say Kansas, some scholars say China. I don't think anyone knows uh, exactly where the flu um, started, but it did circle the globe in three waves. The first wave was in the spring of 1918. 
There were few deaths, but much sickness. This was much like the regular flu uh, from which most people recovered. It probably would not have been noticed had the second wave that began in August, lasted from August to December of 1918, had not been so devastating and virulent. This second wave beginning in August was much worse than the first one. And people realized that they had a serious illness on their hands. And the majority of deaths during this pandemic were, um, the majority was during the second wave. Some people asked, is this the same disease that hit us, you know, back in uh, March? Uh, you know, there was dengue fever. Some people thought it might be that. There's typhus and all sorts of other uh, diseases. And it was the armies who suffered the most. The pandemic would make one third of the men in the United States Army um, sick. And of course, what's happening in the war at this time? Um, the, Amer the Americans arrive, uh, Amer the US declared war on Germany in April of 1917. So all of these soldiers, you know, some of them from Camp Funston go to Europe. A year later, the Germans launched a massive offensive on the Western Front in an attempt to break the stalemate on the Western Front, but it failed. And the Allies, the British, the Americans, the Moroccans, the French launched a counteroffensive and broke um, German lines. Uh, there was chaos in Germany, the Kaiser fled, and World War I eventually uh, ended. So March of 1918 is when the flu pandemic begins. U.S. troops have been there you know, for almost uh, um, a, a year. And there were many, many people in the U.S. Army and these other armies who were, who were very, very uh, sick. And this de definitely affected the outcome of the war. The second phase that, that, that began in late August of 1918 um, affected civilians also. Um, and one big problem was secondary pneumonia infections. Um, and this killed a lot of people. And this was an extremely difficult, grisly way to die because it caused people to turn blue from lack of oxygen. They caught, would cough up bloody mucus, bleed from the ears, the mouth, and the nose. And often uh, the fingernails or the fingers would begin to turn dark, the feet and the limbs. And then much of the body would turn dark. And there would be these mahogany ovals around the cheekbones, the mahogany ovals, that would be a clear indicator that a sick person had the flu. Because, you know, they might have some other strain of the flu. They might have uh, all sorts of things. But if a doctor saw those mahogany ovals, then um, they knew that this was the, the, the flu, the flu vi virus. Um, and so this was an extremely horrible way to die. Doctors sometimes could not tell the white soldiers from the black soldiers, so black and blue were the soldiers' bodies uh, by, the time, by the time that they died. So this comes in waves from 1918 to 1920, and it extends in some places into the winter of 1920. And there were also some health problems that we'll look at in just a moment as late as 1928. Uh, let, let's see. Um, and often, this one way this was different from the COVID is that the flu virus would move into a town or anywhere, and it might ravage a place for six to 10 weeks, and then it was over. And then another wave might come back. This is different from COVID, which is, you know, with us, uh, with us just about, just about everywhere. And even if these vaccines work, you know, um, we're probably, the, the COVID virus is going to be around. It's not just six to 10 weeks and then moving on somewhere else and possibly coming back in, an, in another wave. The population of the world at this time was 1.8 billion, 1.8 billion. So keep that in mind when we look at some of the statistics related to the 1918 flu pandemic, which killed possibly 50 to 100 million people, 50 to 100 million people. More than any other illness in recorded history for such a short time frame. Uh, we said the Black Death possibly killed in the 14th century, possibly killed 20 million. Well, this was 50 to 100 million. Today, that would translate into 225 million or more deaths. And this flu uh, virus infected one third of the globe. 
And as I said, as we said before, it had its origins in uh, animals and birds. Um, 675,000 Americans died, 675,000 out of a population of 103.2 million. So that's about 0.5% of the population in the United States dying. Britain had about the same number, um, same percentage to die. Um, but other countries, depending on how you know, advanced they were, suffered terribly. Um, in the United States, the average life expectancy in one year dropped by 12 years. You know, we said it was younger people between 18 and 45 who were dying. Pregnant women paid a very high price, and a high percentage of pregnant women died from the, from the flu virus. Over 25% of the U.S. population was infected, over 25%. The death toll in the United States was five times higher than U.S. deaths in World War I, and somewhat higher than U.S. deaths in World War I and II and Korea and Vietnam combined. So again, you see just how devastating this was for the world and for um, the United States, but other countries suffered uh, terribly. The ability of, of countries to handle the, the flu pandemic, of course, varied. Um, as one author who uh, wrote a good book on the flu pandemic said, there, you know, there were some countries that were advanced that, that had an easier time handling it. There were other places that were still almost in the uh, middle, middle ages. Um, uh, and this flu pandemic just affected people far and wide. India had the largest number of deaths in any single country, India, 10 to 20 million, as well as the highest percentage of excess deaths. Um, excess deaths would be, um, you know, the deaths that occurred above what could be expected in a normal year, 4.39% in um, India. And um, into the 1920s, although the flu pandemic uh, ended, it caused the brain disease called encephalitis lethargica. This was a late manifestation of the influenza virus that did not come to an end until 1928. And this encephalitis lethargica killed another half million. Again, this is more than all of all of the deaths put together in World War I. And of course, World War I was awful. But yet, um, we remember World War I. We don't, re we don't remember um, as starkly and as vivid vividly this flu pandemic. The pandemic was something that, uh, as one person said, you know, it, it, just, uh, it just appeared like a thief in the night, and it occurred in waves, and it was over. Most of it was over after about two years, whereas the war went, you know, went on for four devastating years and had tremendous, tremendous repercussions. But yet this pandemic may be the most, may be the most important event of the um, uh, 20th century. Its spread was facilitated by railroads and by ocean river shipping. Major cities did not play a role as sources of the virus for rural areas. So quickly did it advance. How were influenza patients um, treated? Um, how viruses worked was not known well. Doctors did not understand that microbes cause disease. So there's a lot that they don't know. There was no vaccine to slow the spread of the flu virus. There were no antibiotics developed to attack secondary infections. And as I pointed out, there were many people who died of sec secondary infections. There really wasn't that much that could be done once someone contracted um, the flu virus. No IVs were used. There were no ventilators as our, hospital, our hospitals have used today. Aspirin was available to lower uh, people's um, temperatures, but time was one's best friend because one's body had to fight off the, uh, fight off the disease. And obviously many people survived this. I mean, 25% of America contracted it, but uh, 675,000 died. There were crude treatments that were employed, such as enemas, bloodletting, and giving patients um, whiskey. What efforts were made to help people avoid getting the influenza virus? Well, you're gonna, you're gonna recognize some of these uh, strategies because this is what we're advised to do today. Hide from the virus, buy time, stay at home. Don't, don't be in large crowds. This is a crowd disease. It has to have a host. 
um, to um, live. So stay out of crowds, stay home if you can, hide, hide from the virus. There were many public service announcements just as we've had in the last uh, year, telling us, what we ought to, telling us what we ought to do. Schools were closed. Does that sound familiar? Church services canceled. And of course, people were told to wear mask, wear a mask. And often the mask were gauze mask and people who refused to wear the mask were called slackers, slackers. So don't be a slacker. Um, and the cities that implemented some restrictions and mask wearing mandates did tend to do better than places that did not. San Francisco was the first city to ma mandate um, mask. Australia, uh, they put like a tight quarantine of shipping for a while to keep sh ships from coming in. And for a while, they kept the pandemic at bay. But then they lifted this, then they lifted the quarantine um, and the pandemic arrived in um, Australia. So hide from the virus and school closures, church services canceled, sporting events sometimes um, canceled, wearing masks. And they also had um, other medicines and things they could take that would actually do virtually nothing to, to uh, help you. Now you may have heard or read that this flu was called the Spanish flu. Um, the poor Spanish, they had nothing to do with starting this flu. Spain did not fight in World War I. And so Spain's press was not as censored as the other presses in France and um, uh, Britain and, other, and Germany. So people got a lot of information about the flu pandemic from the Spanish press. It didn't begin in Spain. It's really not a very good way to describe it. The Spanish king also contracted the influenza virus. So this kind of, you know, he sort of had that star mentality there. The Spanish king contracts. It did not originate in Spain, but the allies, the British, the French, and others were more than happy to blame it on the Spanish. Nobody wants to uh, claim the origins of such a, uh, of such a devastating terrible disease. Nobody wants to claim that. And because of, because of this, the Spanish were sort of blamed for it. Um, and it's sometimes referred to as the Spanish flu. Although, as we know, it probably originated in China or Kansas, or some say it may have originated in France, but I don't know. Um, so it, it's referred to unfairly often as the um, Spanish flu. The results, of course, as I pointed out, were a great deal of death and, and destruction. As I said, as many as 100 million deaths. And just imagine what that did, not only to people, but to the um, uh, economy. Um, however, coming out of this pandemic, public health became more the domain of the state. The pandemic spurred the development of national health care systems in Europe. The first European country to develop a national health care system was in 1883 in Germany, which also developed a social security system when Otto von Bismarck was the chancellor. In the 1910s, Britain and Russia established health care systems. The Bolsheviks under Lenin, after they took over, uh, actually developed something. It wasn't uh, the peasant, the peasants, the national health care system wasn't spread to the peasants. Many of the peasants had died during the revolution in Russia and the Civil War. Um, uh, but um, uh, Russia did establish something like a national health care system. The Bolsheviks didn't like intellectuals, but Lenin was actually kind to the, to the doctors uh, in um, Russia. And so Russia had something like a national health care system in the late 19 teens. And most, country, uh, most countries in Western and Central Europe followed these other countries in developing a national health care system in the 1920s. We also saw after the pandemic, the reporting of health data becoming more systematic. In 1925, every state began submitting morbidity statistics to the national government. The first national health care survey in the United States was conducted in 1935. Um, the League of Nations, which was uh, created by the Treaty of Versailles, also took uh, health measures, uh, you know, uh, uh, seriously. 
It was even believed that Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, when he went to the um, Paris Peace Conference, came down with uh, this flu. One very good biographer, Wilson, said that, yes, he probably had the flu, but it wasn't this strain um, that had been so devastating. And Wilson recovered uh, from the uh, flu. So you have um, countries and these multinational organizations beginning to pay closer attention to health matters throughout the world. China set up a national quarantine system in 1930, and it oversaw quarantine arrangements at all major ports and sent regular epidemiological reports to the League of Nations. And of course, in 1948, uh, Britain would establish the national health care system that it has today. In the 1930s, the United States began relying upon employer-based uh, health insurance. And of course, we also have the same things like the Center for Disease Control today. And the 1918 flu pandemic did spur the development um, of a, a greater awareness of health problems. Um, and it did uh, spur the development of uh, national policies to improve health and also multinational organizations, which played a role in improving uh, health. So I have to have a good PowerPoint here of some uh, of uh, pictures I'd like to go through quickly. This um, is Camp Funston. This is a makeshift hospital at, in Kansas. Um, as I said, after, that, after the virus spread to um, uh, the, uh, Camp Funston, I mean, you see some people are wearing masks, some are not. How would you like to be stuck? How would you like to be stuck in there with all of those uh, sick uh, patients? And as I said, some think it may have, may have begun here, but China's probably a better, better here. Uh, they're not distancing, are they? But they are, they're wearing their mask. And as I said, many people wore a gauze mask. And we learned about how to slow and how to at least try to prevent the spread of the virus through studying this 1918 virus. It's interesting, however, that the vaccines that are being developed, uh, the researchers who developed those learned a great deal from, from AIDS research that was done for, uh, done for several decades. The AIDS researchers went through, a lot, went through a lot of trial and error, and they went through a lot of failure too. Um, but this did help us to develop this, the, COVID, uh, the COVID vaccine, what we learned from AIDS research. Here is a baseball player, an umpire, and a catcher all wearing their mask. And then in the background, you see fans wearing their mask um, also. So they're not slackers here. Um, uh, let's see, let's, let's go to this one. This is an ad about how to prevent influenza. Do not take any person's breath. Keep the mouth and teeth clean. Cover your mouth when you cough. Stay at home if you have a cold. We've all heard these things during the COVID problem. Here's a good one. 100 million people are dying and you're supposed to avoid worry, fear, and fatigue. Uh, not, so, not so easy. Keep warm, get fresh air and sunshine. Don't visit poorly ventilated places. And you see a few more on there. And all of us have seen, all of us have heard and seen signs like this in our society today. Here you have hospital patients who are outside. They did realize that people probably did better when, uh, when, they, when they were outside, just as they tell us today. Go, you know, go outside and get, um, get uh, exercise. Um, the influenza um, interfered with uh, many aspects of life, including politics. Shasta County is in California. Polls not open in this precinct, too much influenza. There were not enough citizens who were well enough and willing to serve on the election board during the influenza epidemic. So they couldn't uh, open uh, the uh, precinct there in Shasta County, California. And here is a public warning. This is in late, um, late October to the citizens of Parkersburg, West Virginia. Um, and um, it, it uh, says to take influenza seriously for the next week or 10 days. And on the right, you see some of the, some of the things they encourage people to do, gargle with like iodine and gargle with salt. Well, that might make you feel a little better because you know, sore throat was one of the, was one of the um, uh, symptoms, uh, sneezing and high fever and then turning this dark color, all, all afflicted people. 
So gargling's not going to do uh, that uh, much. Um, and then on the left, uh, it, uh, it gives you some examples of influenza symptoms and tells you what you need to do. Like if you get sick, go to a doctor immediately. Again, some of the things that we're talking about today. On the right is uh, it's kind of small where I am here, but um, this was October 28th on the left. And I think this is November 6th on the right. They had a ban on the theaters, but the theaters were contemplating lifting the ban. And this was just a week or so after this public warning. So maybe um, the virus was leaving this town or, or was leaving Parkersburg, West Virginia. As I said, it would arrive six to 10 weeks and then it was gone, unlike um, COVID. And it says we're fumigating, cleaning and renovating. Um, in order to get the theaters up and running in Park Parkersburg again, again, just like we've heard during the COVID pandemic. And here is um, uh, a newspaper from o October telling us that Vicks Vapor Rub uh, is in short supply. Um, and uh, at the bottom in, the, in this middle column down here, you can actually, you actually see um, the term Spanish flu is mentioned down here. And they're informing citizens in the area to purchase only a small supply that they're running out, although they although there were hundreds of thousands of bottles that were ordered and they're almost out. They thought they had enough to last until January and they're already out, it's the end of October. And so you can only, you can only buy a little bit. You have to be careful. You need your Vicks vapor rub, which again is not going to do a whole lot to stop this terrible, this terrible virus. Um, here are two good books, John M. Barry, The Great Influenza, um, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history. You can also get some good interviews uh, of Barry on YouTube. Uh, he's a very good writer. America's Forgotten Pandemic, Alfred Crosby, also another good book. Pale Rider, The Spanish Flu of 1918 by Laura Spinney. I've, I've read a lot of that book this week, and it's a very, very good book published by public affairs, and then pandemic 1918. These are eyewitness accounts of the pandemic problems by Catherine Arnold. And there's much more writing and many articles, both popular and scholarly in the last few decades. But it really took quite a while for historians to begin to focus on this pandemic and to describe uh, what it did to people and uh, how it affected those who came later. And in the last few decades, historians have focused on this much more. Uh, one person said, you know, the, the pandemic bedeviled people while it was here. And then after it left, it would bedevil historians trying to find out questions where it started, why it started, you know, how, how to stop it. And we definitely learned things from this time that we're implementing um, today. Um, and, hof and hopefully we are, we're at least having a better experience than we did then. And we know, a much, we know much more about these diseases than we did just a century ago. Um, and I thank you very much and, uh, for patiently uh, listening to this talk. Um, and I will take uh, any questions or comments from you. One of the participants wanted to know if you have any comments about the 1918 flu specifically in Paducah. Uh, in Paducah, you know, that's a good question. And I, um, I don't, I was thinking about that today about um, the local area and then also uh, Kentucky. If you're at Murray State, that might be a great subject for a research paper. But as far as specifically Paducah, I can't, I can't tell you. I would imagine, you know, with all the river traffic there, that um, the pandemic hit probably hit soon and probably hit very hard with all of the river traffic in Paducah. Well, let me ask you, um, why, why, do you why do you think it's called the forgotten pandemic? Why would something so horrible, one of the worst, worst health disasters in the history of the world and the worst health disaster of the 20th century that killed maybe 100 million people, why would it be sort of pushed to the backs, back, back of our minds? Is it something that's just too horrible to think about? Any thoughts on that? Okay, uh, Michelle, same with typhoid and polio. Can you kind of give us the context of your idea there? Uh, what I was <clears throat> referring to is that uh, the early half of the 20th century, there were a lot of uh, diseases that were very common and very deadly that oh, yeah. uh, today we don't uh, remember. 
in our group memory. Right. Well, that's a that's a very good point. Um, and sometimes when it came to this pandemic, some people would say, "Well, is this a different is this a different disease?" You know, and what and what do we what do we call it? Um, finally, I think it was the World Health Organization who said that we're not we're not going to name diseases after people or places anymore. And uh, we're not going to name them after foods either. And so they stopped some of that. But you're right. There were a lot of other terrible diseases that we don't we don't think about as much. Rebecca says my mother-in-law remembered her mother fixing food to take to sick houses in Livingston County. That that's interesting. Um, there were definitely problems with uh, in some places with starvation, and the flu killed starving people for obvious reasons quickly. Like it was especially bad in Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil. Um, and crime went up because people were trying to find food and they were stealing and breaking, breaking into play, places. But um, you want to comment on that, Rebecca, about your mom? My mother-in-law was born in 1906. So she was a little girl during the uh, 1918 pandemic. And they were rural country folks in Livingston County. And she said she would remember her mother would make up, tie up bundles of food and her job was to run and drop it off at the porch and run right back <laughs> so that she didn't get sick herself. Right, right. Well, that, that's interesting. How, how long did she do that? Was it for months, years? Probably a few months. Okay, right. Because, yeah, you know, because as I said, it came in waves, unlike the COVID, which is just with us almost everywhere. So if you could get through the wave, you know, you, you would probably be okay. Right. So, um, all right, thank you. Well, there's a lot of good writing out there, so check it out. And um, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a, not always happy, but it's important for us to, to uh, know. I should say also another point that John Barry made was that one reason it was so bad is that public officials just were not always completely honest and were not as aggressive in trying to, to slow the spread and you know, uh, since last March, we've, um, you know, our government officials have debated about what to say, about how much to, about how much information to give. Can we depress people so much they just kind of give up, or do we encourage them? And so was, I think it was difficult on them. But Barry points out that some government leaders should have done better about leveling with American citizens and on restrictions also. Okay. Any other questions? All right, Bobby, thanks a lot. I really do appreciate it and really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everybody. Right. Thank you.